Good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to the London Society's uh, webinar and book club discussion conversation all about uh, Terence Conran this evening. Um, it's really lovely to have you uh, all on board for this, and I've been really looking forward to uh, this discussion because for me personally, I think Terence Conran had such an impact on my life, uh, particularly first arriving in 1995 in, uh, in London from Australia. And um, we have uh, two fantastic uh, speakers or conversationalists uh, here this evening. And uh, but before I introduce them, I just want to let you know that um, we have some bad news. Unfortunately, Stephen uh, Bailey uh, is very ill today and can't join us and we um, it's completely unavoidable and we we send him our uh, best wishes and hope for a speedy recovery um, but who we do have is we have the co his co-author of this um, the new book Terence uh, uh, the man who invented design and his co-author uh, is Roger Maverty, who is with us this evening. And Roger and Stephen have worked on, I think, four books together. Uh, so hopefully, Roger, you can not only speak for yourself, but also for Stephen uh, during the, the next hour. And also, we have Tim Bowder-Ridger, who is the principal of Conrad and Partners, which, of course, is the um, architecture practice which was set up in by Terence and, of course, lives on and is hugely successful well beyond uh, uh, his lifetime, which is, which is a great testament to him. So... Uh, again, just to remind you, uh, Q and A's. You know, a good discussion is one where we get lots of questions, and Terence is a is a mighty subject, so I expect lots of questions coming through. Um, but to start off, Roger, I'm going to ask you to uh, not so much introduce yourself, but introduce your relationship with Terence and what what brought you to to write the book. Well, my relationship with Terence started really quite badly. I'd just won the Habitat advertising account. And the first conversation after saying thank you, practically, that I had with him was, um, we also handle the advertising for The Guardian, which I worked on. And I persuaded Terence to take a full page in colour. And since he's probably one of the meanest entrepreneurs you'll ever meet, um, that was quite a struggle of salesmanship, um, but he agreed. We took a full page colour ad in The Guardian and unfortunately the very gifted art director who worked on it, the ad was a sort of grid of different things that were in Habitat at the time, decided it would look visually rather better if she shifted a couple of the objects, uh, uh, but she unfortunately forgot to shift the copy which went with it and the prices. So my first tricky conversation with Terence on the phone was when I rang him up to tell him that uh, his first ad in the national press was advertising a very nice chest of drawers at 595 and a pair of oven gloves at 215 pounds. <laughs> so it was an awkward start to the relationship. But in spite of that, we kind of got on. Um, and even though he has a reputation of being rather difficult and a reputation he deserves, he was a very easy person to like. Uh, and uh, we became chums and I worked with him on in three different advertising agencies. Uh, and then I left advertising and got a proper job and we stayed as friends. And then uh, when I was at an age when most sensible people have uh, retired, he asked me to take over as chief exec of Conran, uh, the whole lot, which I did. And it was an exciting time. I think that's, uh, um, I mean, we'll come come to this during the conversation, but the fact that after having him as a client, uh, you decided to go and work for him full time, I think is testament to your relationship. I have to say, there's not, there are certain clients I have that I probably wouldn't want to go and work with them full time. Um, so I think that's quite amazing. Well, um, I'm, I'm bound to say he was one of the ones I said to my wife, I never would work with full time. Right. Uh, and actually, when he offered me the job, um, I turned it down. Um, and then about three months later, we were having lunch. And he said, I thought you'd call this lunch to say you changed your mind. And I said, no, no, I call this lunch because it's nice having lunch with you. And he said, that's a shame. We could have had fun. And 
I just thought, yeah, somebody offers you on the job on the basis you could have fun. That's very tempting. So I rang them the next morning, so they have changed my mind. Excellent. Excellent. Tim, uh, you're an architect. You know, you started with Terence when you were very young. Tell us about uh, how your relationship came about. Yeah, so I, I joined Terence at Inter Connor and Partners uh, in 1997. So I originally was employed to as his project architect when he was still expanding his uh, restaurant empire. Um, so I very we, we got on very well very quickly because his expectation was for me to be his tame Rottweiler on his building sites and you know really make sure it happened when it should happen. But the first conversation I had with him was the first thing he ever said to me, ever said to me, was, are you a Tory? At which point I you know, denied all knowledge. After that, it was all fine. So, you know, that, were, that was his interview of me. Um, but then it went on to uh, working with him for about directly on his projects for a whole number of years. And then I went on to working on to larger projects. I came back work I uh, stayed in the practice but started working with him again on the boundary project which is just off Shoreditch High Street which I think is pretty much the last uh, project Terence was directly uh, involved with and uh, was certainly seen at the time uh, the critics considered it uh, to be a real exemplar of what Terence was about and that was about uh, doing something imaginative with the building and then following it all the way down through every single detail. So, you know, obviously it's fundamentally a series of restaurants with uh, guest rooms attached, getting right down to the tiny detail. So as an architect, I'd be talking to him about menus. Uh, you know, so that, that was very key and very influential, influential in my life. And he asked me to take over the architecture the leadership of the architecture firm in 2010, at which point he was starting to back away from the day-to-day -day business, but it didn't stop him phoning me up almost on a daily basis to give me uh, lots of advice on what I was doing wrong, mainly. Right. But, um, no, it, 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 was, it was, as Roger says, very, very intense, but there was a lot of fun, especially involving uh, big lunches mm -hmm. um, through all the time I worked with him. Mm. Um, I, I think that comes through very clearly, you know, in everything I've read about uh, Terence, but also in the in the book about his his love of food and how that, in, you know, infiltrated everything to do with office life and 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 everything else. Um, but Roger, I'm going to the, the important thing about there is an important thing about the food thing with Terence because it and we've all used it. It's a very good way of getting people off guard. Mm -hmm. So it's a very good way. And that's what he used to do all the time. I knew if he was after something with me, he'd either offer me lunch or a cigar. Right. And, 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 and if I wanted a big thing, it'd be both. And it, it was about getting into that very, you couldn't work for Terence without having a very personal relationship with him. And he used that as a tool time and time again. And actually, if you went with it, it was quite fun. But um, you had to know what he was up to at the same time. Right. Excellent. Um, the, the conversation tonight is sort of focused on how Terence or did Terence change London? And uh, I know we'll meander through other things, you know, food and uh, his personality and everything else. But Roger, can you take us sort of back to his first forays into the retail sector because for me I find that you know if you look at Tottenham Court Road at the moment you know it's uh, it was furniture central um, uh, with habitat and heels and and now that's changing dramatically so I think it's timely that we discuss his impact on on retail and um, uh, you know tell us about how how he first got into that. Well I mean to most people younger than me which is about 98 percent of the global population Habitat is simply a rather sort of forgotten, buried brand. But when it actually happened originally, it was quite life-changing. London in the 50s was in a sort of 
aftermath shadow of the, se of the Second World War. It was depressed and depressing. And suddenly there was a great kind of huge cultural change in the 60s with music from the Beatles and the Stones and sort of young fashion came in with people like Mary Quant and so forth. And Terence had a huge part in that because before furniture had been dull stuff sold in dull places, department stores by and large. And in fact, the reason that he invented Habitat was because he designed a range of furniture. And when he went around the department stores to find out how it was going, they all said, I'm terribly sorry, we're not buying anymore because nobody wants to buy your furniture. They don't like it. And of course, being Terence, he said, no, no, it's not my fault for having nasty furniture. It's your fault for having nasty shops to sell it in. Uh, and he was right, actually. And he thought, well, if, if people don't like my furniture in this environment, I've got to create an environment which they do like it in. So, so, and Habitat was more than a shop. It was an environment. You walked in and been nothing like it before. It was very, you know, the displays were incredibly generous. If you wanted to promote a red enamel coffee pot, which was one of their best selling lines in the early days, you didn't have a coffee pot. He had a kind of ziggurat of 100. Mm -hmm. And the staff were all chosen because they were glamorous looking and they had their hair cut by Vidal Sassoon. And it was an exciting place to be and it was glamorous. And, you know, London hadn't seen a place before which made people feel, my God, I can, you know, before modern furniture was very expensive from a few specialist shops. And suddenly ordinary people could buy exciting, well-designed, simple stuff and take it home in the back of their Citroen Der Chevaux. It was revolutionary. Was it an instant hit or did it take, did it take time? It took about 11 seconds, I would say. Mm -hmm. Wow. Really? I, I remember when I was about 19, I was living in a ghastly bed sitter in London. I'd just come down from the north to try and make my fame and fortune. Still hopeful on those fronts. Um, uh, and, you know, I lived in this hideous bed sitter. I was embarrassed for people to see. But I'd been to friends' flats who were slightly older than me, got a bit more dough, and they actually had their own furniture. I thought it'd be nice to do this one day. And I walked into Habitat, and it was electrifying. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, the impossible was possible. So it had an incredibly fast effect. And, and uh, so tell me about or uh, uh, tell us about how he took habitat from you know grew it and then then it crashed i mean what what happened during those years i think uh is really really interesting um well it was an enormous success very very quickly he opened up across london then across the rest of provincial britain and he opened up two stores in paris and he opened up in new york it was a huge business it, uh, that he built up over about 10, 15 year period. And it was terrific. And then um, he got greedy and he decided that what he effectively, he wanted to take over the high street. And I once asked Terence, what was the retailer he most admired? And I thought he was going to choose someone that was quite distinctive and recherche. But he said, actually the retailer I most admire is Marks and Spencer's. He said it without a moment's hesitation. And in the same way that Henry Ford's dream was to, to democratize the car, Terence's dream was to democratize design. And he thought Habitat was making affordable design available to everybody, but he wanted to make affordable everything available to everybody, clothes, whatever. That's why he admired M&S, because he thought that was the kind of people's store. And he couldn't buy M&S, but he could buy uh, British Home Stores, or BHS as it became, which was a sort of rather blurred carbon copy of M&S. But it had a lot of big sites, and it was struggling. And he thought, I can transform it. I will design nice things, and everybody will go there. Uh, so he floated Habitat, used the money to buy BHS, bought lots of other things to go with it in a rather Terence indiscriminate, crazy overly enthusiastic way. He wasn't very self-disciplined, really. Um, and um, when he got into doing it, he suddenly hit a brick wall. Because, of course, the reason that Habitat worked was that everybody in Habitat knew what the 
they knew what Terence wanted. It was it wasn't a business. It was almost like a kind of religious cult. Whereas BHS was rather stodgy and the people who worked in it were a bit like the store. They were slightly behind the times. They were very reluctant to accept Terence's designs. They thought their customers would be rather frightened of habitat-y kind of stuff. And so every time Terence tried to redesign the underwear or the shoes or whatever it was, there was somebody in BHS sort of trying to make it a bit more trad and boring. And the result was a complete sort of compromise catastrophe. The business utterly failed to make money. Uh, the city lost their patience with Terence, who was far too mercurial for their tastes. And the whole thing collapsed like a house of cards in a puff of wind. And Terence was publicly humiliated. The Times wrote an article, a leader article, saying that he'd sort of been exposed as somebody who's kind of overreached himself, blah, blah, blah. It was really quite a cruel article. And he was forced to sell off all of the businesses. Uh, Habitat got bought by IKEA, his biggest rival, which was a bitter blow. Uh, and that was the end of the dream. Yeah, I think, I, again, you know, reading the book during this stage of his life, I mean, it's, um, it's clear that, you know, his... Uh, sort of personality traits and drive are, were his greatest gift, but also his greatest uh, problem, particularly with BHS. I mean, I I, uh, uh, I was thinking of sort of um, uh, stores around the UK suddenly having to stock his his stuff and not getting him, um, and uh, the sort of cultural differences. And he wasn't really interested in bringing them on board, really, was he? He, he didn't seem to, you know, he wasn't a man who wanted to go and walk the floor around the, the country. Absolutely not. The idea of kind of negotiating with people to kind of fall in love with your dream was completely alien to him. As far as he was concerned, you did it. It was self-evidently good. Everybody get that end of story. And of course, to some extent, with Habitat, he'd been proved right. He said, you know, if you offer people something great and inexpensive, they'll love it. And they did. And he couldn't really understand why that didn't work when he's rehashing somebody else's idea rather than when he's working with his own creation. Mm -hmm. But the fascinating thing for me about that whole series of events was not that it crashed, which it did in the most humiliating way, but it crashed when he was about 55. Uh, he had a beautiful wife, family, plenty of money in the bank, thank you very much. Um, you know, most people at that age thinking my business has been swept away from me, but I've still got, you know, tens of millions in the bank. But think, actually, now's the time to do a bit less and take stock of my wine cellar. But Terence isn't like that, and he kind of bounced back, having been the king of retail, as the king of restaurants in the most extraordinary way. And if we if we go on to the restaurants uh, again, I, I I agree with you. I I found that uh, uh, that fascinating because I you know not being far from fifty five myself, I suddenly thought, you know, I would have given up. Uh, gone back to the garden and the dogs and just relaxed and uh, he was so incredibly driven and and the next stage of his career I think was I guess to a certain extent the part that you know that for early part was how he changed sort of retail and how we lived um, and uh, but then he really started to have an impact on actual London with the restaurant scene and really changing places um, and Tim I mean where when we before you worked for Terence, when was the first time you became aware of sort of his impact on, on, uh, uh, on London life? Pretty much uh, as soon as I came to London. Uh, I, when I, I left uh, architecture school right in the middle of the early 90s recession and uh, was, you know, like all young architects, they're desperate to get work. And uh, managed to get uh, working in Clerkenwell, literally around the corner from where we are now. Um, and places like Metso were oh my God. amazing. Yeah. You know, they, they were just off a different planet. And 
you know, watching the, you know, and Pont de la Tour, you know, everybody told him he was completely mad for building Pont de la Tour on the south side of the river. And of course, he loved the fact that he could prove them wrong, you know, to the point Bill Clinton and Tony Blair were eating there, for goodness sake. Um, so, but I, th I think Roger touched on a really important point here, um, because I think we've seen here the, the restaurants, Terence grew the restaurant empire bigger than he should have. What Terence was really good at was design, designing, and I mean it designing with an absolute capital D because he, he was designing everything. You know, if I was working with him on a restaurant, we were not allowed to touch a pencil and see it till we'd seen the menu. And then debated the menu, for goodness sake. You know, he's expecting you to do it because, you know, he's, if it was a, particularly a restaurant designed for young people, he wanted to know what young people, if young people got it at all. Um, and if we didn't get it, it was our fault, by the way, not his. So, you know, you had to, you had to, if you had a strong opinion, you had to really uh, battle for it. But when the, the re restaurant empire became very, very big and it started to be involving rollouts, and he was still trying to do rollouts uh, in 2000, in the early, you know, 2010, 15, that sort of period. It never worked because it lost that flair, that personal touch, which the Habitat and then the Conrad shop um, really uh, uh, achieved. And the moment that went away, you know, it needed every element he, he thought about to work. And if you delegate that, there'll be bits missing, which means it's lesser than the, the sum of its parts. And I think that that was critical. And he was the most intuitive person I've ever worked with. You know, he, he was deeply unintellectual. You know, he wasn't into reading theories about anything. Um, and of course, he used to get very frustrated with our, our young architects having lots of sort of intellectual ideas about what they're doing, as far as he was concerned, did it feel right or didn't it feel right? And that was it. And, and he, you know, you wouldn't know until uh, the end of the project. And you try selling that idea to a client um, that oh, I don't know what it's gonna be like, I'll tell you at the end, you know, sort of thing, it doesn't work. But when he was developing for himself, that's how, how it worked, whether it was restaurants or all these big development schemes. Of course, he was a terrible developer because of that. Because he absolutely I mean, it, it it's, it's true he was the most terrible he was a brilliant creator of ideas and he was an equally brilliant neglector of them once he got them going because mm. he just bored incredibly quickly so he's if you track everything in his career they're fantastic ideas uh, but then he kind of just has to move on to the next thing and they get slightly forgotten but having said that he was a brilliant ideas person and he told me a wonderful story about how the development of Butler's Wharf began which you know there's that stretch of the river from Tower Bridge going past where the Pont de la Tour is and the design museum and all of that which is really quite a stunning reshaping of that part of London uh, which before had been absolutely derelict um, truly derelict uh, and he told me that he was on one of those sort of boat trips down the river where a lot of people get together and have a office party. So we're not allowed to say that, have a work event with champagne. Um, no cake. <laughs> no, well, a bit of cake, possibly. <laughs> uh, and he, they were steaming down the river towards Canary Wharf and they came under Tower Bridge and Terence saw this stretch of absolutely derelict landscape. And he turned around to uh, Geoffrey Sterling, Lord Sterling to you as his host, uh, and said, Geoffrey, uh, you could do something with that. I wonder who owns it. And Geoffrey Sterling said, well, actually, I do. So Terence said, fine, call me in the morning and tell me the price. So he just saw it. As Tim said, he's completely instinctive about these things. No sort of rubbish about accountants doing cost-benefit analyses or any of that nonsense. Just, it looks good, we'll buy it. And he spent the next several years with people telling him it would never work because it's the wrong side of the river and blah-de-blah. -blah. And of course, it's been an incredible success. 
It did, of course, go bust as a uh, as a development yeah, project. Well, all, all good entrepreneurs have a few decent bankruptcies under their yeah, belt. Yeah, they're not trying okay. hard enough. He, he yeah he um and he had quite a talent for that because it was he was thinking, you know he he would invest in a way as you say, accountants or um, quantity surveyors would advise you against, and he he wouldn't take no for an answer in that respect. For a very long time, you know, Butler's Wharf really was finishing in the late eighties, and for a very long time we were getting approaches by developers who had seen that both you know we had, had Hamburg City Council come to visit uh, us because they wanted to regenerate their Docklands uh, in a very similar way so he everybody else who was looking at that site were going to just flatten it it was just and you would have had the really delightful postmodern little houses all dotted all over it as you as you saw elsewhere in the Docklands appear at that time. So I think he I think Butler's Wharf is one of those moments where Terence really set a new way of thinking without knowing it. You know, he thought it was Oh absolutely. I mean I think you know when just listening to you uh both talk, you know, about habitat and sort of the restaurants, I think, you know, the he had this amazing capacity to touch the ordinary person. And I, I sort of discovered Terence not through the sort of high church of architecture, but through ordinary people. And, you know, I, I, when we first started deciding to do this, uh, this talk, um, it, I, I was reminded that on my very first day in, uh, um, in London, my, I was staying, I was staying at a, uh, on a friend's sofa in Swiss Cottage, and she was a Kiwi nurse. And uh, she said to me, you know, I've got to, um, I'm going to take you down to this really amazing place called the Design Museum and Butler's Wharf. It's really amazing. Um, that's probably not, that's not a Kiwi accent. But, um, and so we, we trekked down and there was the Design Museum sitting alone with everything was uh, pulled down, you know, this white building. And, you know, she loved it she thought it was the coolest thing she'd ever seen and then we went and had a coffee and all of that sort of thing um same with quaglinos you know that was every australian who traveled to london went to quaglinos that was the thing to do um so i don't know how we found out about it we didn't have the internet in those days but it was the big moment when you felt a bit uh, polished and posh and you went down those stairs and uh he made those moments I yeah. think we found out about it by a thing which doesn't exist anymore, thanks to the internet. It's called talking to each other. Yeah. It might be interesting. Can we ask Rowena to put up the first picture? Let's see what happens. Does the technology work? That is Butler's Wharf, um, as parents saw it. If you can put up the second one, please. That's exactly the same place, and that's the Design Museum. And, you know, that is, the, for me, the most perfect example of somebody transforming a part of London. So that, that intuitive, that was an old banana warehouse. And just the fact that it sort of ziggurated up, um, the conversation with Terence and my, my predecessor actually was the, the project architect for that. It was, rec you know, he, intuitively, he just saw it as a, a Bauhaus type form. And he didn't need to have really talk about it much more, you know, that's what it's been. As it happens, the practice at that time were fighting the the, the fight for modernism at a, a time when postmodern modernism was, was was really sort of dominating through the Prince Charles actions. And uh, I think he had Margaret Thatcher come to see this. Um, didn't she didn't bless her, she didn't understand any of it. Um, but um, you, you, you mentioned my favorite architectural expert there, Prince Charles. Mm. His only comment on seeing the Design Museum, which is an enormous investment of Terence's time and money and passion in transforming an extraordinary part of our capital from nothing to something remarkable. Prince Charles's only remark was, Why hasn't it got a pitched roof? <laughs> um, so I'm going to vote Republican at the next election. <laughs> it might be interesting to show while we're on it, ask uh, Rowena to show the next slide. This is Michelin House uh, and 
again, what is Terence is associated with modern design and new things, but actually quite a lot of his passion was about restoring old stuff and, and giving it a new life. And Michelin House, which was a disused derelict tire factory, um, he transformed, but he transformed it backwards. He made it uh, how it was in the first place. Uh, and it's, it's you know, you go to uh, the Conran shop, which is part of it, you go to the Bendham restaurant. It is still, a, you know, a thrilling experience. Uh, and I remember talking to Terence, and I congratulated him because it was amazing. And he said, well, the interesting thing was when we tried to redo the stained glass windows, all of which had got broken, if you can move on to the next slide, Ruina, we'll see one of them. Uh, no, we won't. There it is. There we go. Um, he said, of course, we got all the reference photographs from when the building was put up. But of course, it was in the area when photography was in black and white. So they had to reimagine the colours of the stained glass, which I think they've done as Monsieur Bibendum leaping about with a cigar in his mouth. I think they've done it rather beautifully. I think this, this along with Butler's Wharf, um, Bibendum is, is from a, a London-wide perspective, is, is a very a very important sort of touch point. So Terence was an, an amazing catalyst. Before Bibendum was restored, that part of you know, Fulham Road that ran there wasn't somewhere you'd choose to go to. The moment Terence did this and restored it, restored the iconography of the architecture, but then made the inside of it equally glamorous and equally accessible, the whole neighborhood changed. Yeah, it, it's easy to, I mean, it's all sort of around there. It's all kind of Stella McCartney and, you know, oligarch pricing. But it's easy to forget that when Michelin House was originally developed, it was a fairly unremarkable, unexciting, albeit central part of London. Can you take away the slide, Rowena, because I'm getting more... I've, you've done it. That's nice. Thank you. Um, the um, if it's, uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, Roger will pick up on that uh, slightly uh, again because you know again Butler's Wharf. I mean the the, the image you showed was uh, uh, was testament to the fact that nobody wanted to go there. I mean it was and people forget that now. It's so obvious that it's a success. So people don't realize if they're if they're younger how how bad it was. But the um, just on the restaurant uh, side of things and the rollout of all the restaurants, I mean, it's interesting at the moment, you know, the, um, Corbyn and King are in the press at the moment with their uh, sort of issues and sort of was Terence the creator of the mega restaurant chain? Because it, it seems like, you know, Corbyn and King are fighting against the idea of the rolling, rolling out too many restaurants. But was he the creator of these, you know, every every restaurateur has to have 30 restaurants under their under their belt? Um, well, we're, they're, they're not really a chain in the sense that they're all different. Yes. Uh, and when he tried to do a chain with a thing which a concept called Zinc, which was a sort of simplified version of a typical Terence restaurant, it was a failure because I think what Terence did brilliantly well was excitement. And actually, if you try and make something slightly more standardized, so it's mass produced, it kind of instinct instantly loses that excitement. But I think, um, you know, you're saying that Corbyn and King are sort of wondering how many restaurants you should have. Terence never wondered how many of anything you should have. You should just have five times more than any normal human being could imagine. I mean, he just loves scale and generosity and extravagance in every kind of of way mm. you know his house used to be a school i don't know what he did with the space um in every way he just thought huge yeah. it, 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 and, and it is interesting that terence that you know he had when he when D, &D did the management buyout there was sort of around 30 restaurants um involved and they with the exception of the zincs they were all one-off restaurants so they were treated like standalone independent restaurants. You know, the chef and the manager had uh, 
a job to do there to make them work in their own right. And that's when it worked really, really well. There is, I think, a limit to uh, how successful that can be, because even in those circumstances, the moment Terence's attention was so diluted that he couldn't be that independent restaurateur who was down there every night and, you know, correcting the menus and, you know, throwing out dodgy flat displays. He was losing his, you know, the, the flair which only Terence really uh, produced. And I think that's very, very, I don't think there's anybody who could really do it at that scale as successfully as he did. But, you know, we all know that, you know, restaurants like Pont, Pont de la Tour, if you go there now, they're typically very empty. Mm. I mean, it, it now is a bit unfair because obviously everything was empty, but, you know, just before uh, COVID kicked in. And that was because it became unloved, I think. Mm. Quick, quick Corbin and King story for you. Uh, Terence was having restaurant, uh, having a lunch with a friend in one of their restaurants and King was there kind of walking the floor and looking after it. So Terence rather grandly summoned him towards him. So he did. And he said, I must congratulate you, dear boy. The food here is much improved. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a wonderful backhanded compliment. But getting back to Terence's obsession with Big, I remember once I was chatting to him. One of his former partners was Rodney Fitch. He was a very good designer in his own right and built up a very successful design business and for a while made a lot of money. And he invited, I, I knew Rodney reasonably well, he invited me to a party he was having his place in the country, which I'd never been to before. And this came up in conversation with Terence, and he said, are you going? And I said, no, no, I don't really want to, I'm just staying at home in London. And Terence said, you must go, dear boy, prodding me on the shoulder, you must go, you must, just to see his house, it's huge. And then he thought for a bit as if he kind of revealed a slight weakness, and he prodded me again, he said, but it's not as huge as mine. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, just on sort of just slightly sticking to the restaurants and, you know, changing London. Um, one of the things that uh, seems to have, you know, in my time in London, the sort of outdoor dining scene, you know, when I first arrived here, it wasn't a thing. I mean, except Pont de la Tour, you know, that was pretty wild, wasn't it? Being able to go and sit outside. His his love of France and uh, did he have a strong impact on that? Again, I remember Bluebird Cafe. That was absolutely groundbreaking. I mean, all of my girlfriends and I, you know, you'd meet on a Saturday morning at Bluebird. It was so she-she. Um, and the outdoor tables and all of that sort of thing was so new. It just didn't happen. Um, what, what, what view, it, did he bring France into London? Well, I, I, I think he did. I mean, Terence had spent a lot of time as a young man touring around France, kind of soaking it up and loving it. Uh, and uh, although he had four wives, I think his real love affair was with was with France, actually. Um, but I think going beyond that, it's not just about France. I think what Terence brought to London wasn't just a bit of Gallic style i think what he brought was a sense that in the same way as habitat wasn't just a shop that you bought furniture in it was kind of a buzz and just going there even if you didn't want anything was just it was fun to be there mm -hmm. what he realized about a restaurant is it's not just a place where you eat food it's a place where you have fun and you flirt and you watch other people and you wonder what they're talking about and you soak up the atmosphere and, and while you're there you're in a kind of different, slightly elevated world. And I think what he did, he didn't really create restaurants, he created experiences. Mm. Uh, it, was, uh, it was always very, um, the physical design of the restaurants was all centered around theater. Mm. And I mean, his classic one is always to have, is whenever he could possibly do it is to have an exposed kitchen because he felt that was the theater. So that if you were with a, a dull companion at your dinner, there's always something to talk about. There's always something to watch. And I think uh, Quaglinos is, yeah, the entrance of Quaglinos, how theatrical could you possibly be? Actually, you know, Mezzo was 1920s Berlin in, in, in its decadence and, you know, uh, its campness really. 
And uh, but even when you got down to the, the original zinc, which she did on Heddon Street, um, there was a sense that theatrical sense of you just going, you've left London, you've gone somewhere else. And he was completely, you know, he, his great thing with restaurants, you'd, you'd have a good meal of some type from some international cuisine and decide he's going to do a restaurant wrapped around that cuisine. Mm. Now, I, I, Roger will remember, I, there's a point where I was, we were exploring whether we should do more in, uh, work in India. And, you know, Terence kept threatening to open an Indian restaurant in, at a time when Indian restaurants weren't particularly fashionable. He'd, he'd have probably done it rather well because actually he, he loved India. Yeah. But he, he, he was a person of extraordinary contradictions. I, I mean, he was in the same breath, practically, incredibly generous and incredibly mean. Um, when he asked me to be his chief exec, I turned it down because, partly because I just accepted a place to do a, an MA uh, in photography at university, which would take one day a week. And he said, look, if you want to do the job, why don't you just do both? Take Fridays off. I don't care. And it was amazing. You know, not many people employ chief executive on the basis that they start off part time. Uh, it was extraordinary. And yet when I got there, he spent virtually every time I sat down with him, he said, I notice you're still drinking Earl Grey tea. All the rest of the staff are very happy with PG tips. <laughs> These are frugal times, Roger. Don't you think you should be leading by example? Uh, and then he'd say, let's go out to Pontoato and have a nice lunch. And he'd buy two bo a bottle of white for 200 quid and a bottle of red for 200 quid, neither of which we would finish. So, I mean, he was incredibly generous and incredibly stingy at the same time. Very, very yeah, very complex. Um, the, the, uh, can I sort of something that's slightly close to my heart and I'm a bit irritated by it is the movement of the design museum over to uh, Kensington. I mean, why, why did he make that move? What was, what was behind that? And um, do you think it's been successful? Was he happy with that? I think the, um, the prime driver was space. Hmm. They ran out of space in Butler's Wharf, but there could have been a solution in Butler's Wharf for that. But it was another, as Roger says, it's another exciting project, wasn't it, Roger? Yeah, I mean, Terence, you know, because he built the design museum, Terence thought, right, well, now we've done it, let's forget about it and neglect it and fall out of love with it. What should we do next? Oh, we'll have a bigger and better design museum. It was just part of that sort of, sort of almost kind of madness to always want to reach to the next stage. But, yeah. I mean, interestingly, he chose very in character a beautiful building which was utterly neglected because the Commonwealth Institute, which was famous really for rather dull exhibitions about groundnut cultivation in Gambia or whatever, uh, was an extraordinary piece of architecture. It was virtually, literally almost falling down. And Terence recreated it and here it is. It's utterly amazing building. Um, but I have to say, I think it's slightly too grandiose for its purpose. And the only way of getting it funded was to put up two big blocks of flats beside it, which are quite distinctive pieces of architecture in their own right, but they utterly obscure the view. Mm. Uh, this is the first time I've seen a good, a good image of, of the design museum, because I live quite near it, but you can't see it properly from the street because it's shielded by the buildings which were part of the, in quotes, planning game, or how I get somebody else to pay for it, to be more precise. Mm. So I think his sort of passion about the design museum really didn't encompass any thought about what it was actually for and how it was going to pay for itself. It was just a thing he sort of wanted to do. And, and frankly, that was every project, building project he got involved in, it's the same thing. And you know, his passion for reusing existing buildings, which I do think is a particularly valuable legacy he's left. I mean, certainly it's very central to our practices culture you know you, the center point is a recent example of that that wish and that passion which i think i i shared with terence from day one of let's not waste things let's we, we were think we were talking about sustainability in terms of cultural sustainability you know all these buildings and structures um have 
cultural memory and they have a place and it's what London does better than any city in the world, frankly, uh, is that layering up of history. You can walk around the city and, you know, you've got a Wren church next to a completely contemporary office building and it all hangs together in that sort of rather unplanned way, which is the whole way London has operated for centuries. And he really got that. But there were also, to Roger's point, there was a certain meanness about it because he felt, and he was quite, in theory, you'd be absolutely right. Well, if I don't, if I reuse all that stuff, I'm going to save myself a lot of money. Well, reality. Tea bag. The, 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 yeah. But, but to Tim's point, can I just, um, to illustrate that, can you, Rowena, could you show slide seven? Not yet, apparently, but maybe. If it appears, it's an image of Paris. And if it doesn't, I'm going to carry on anyway. I took my wife a while ago to Paris for the weekend. And uh, just for the two of us to have a romantic weekend, we had a lovely dinner on the Friday night on the uh, right bank. And we were walking back to our hotel on the left bank. And I stopped on the bridge going over the river. And I pointed to that view. And I said, isn't that amazing? And my wife, somewhat to my disappointment, there was a two beats pause. And she said, no, not really. It reminds me of Bath or Leamington Spa. It's very beautiful, preserved in aspic and completely without life. And can you go to the next slide, Rowena? A couple of weeks later, we were walking over Waterloo Bridge after seeing a show on, at the National Theatre to get the tube home. And she stopped me on the bridge this time and pointed to this view down towards Canary Wharf. And she said, now do you understand what I mean about Paris and London? This has got lots of stuff which is hideous and should be knocked down. And it's got lots of magical stuff next door to it. And it's an extraordinary muddle. But this place is dynamic. It's alive. Things are happening. And I think that is what has made London such a kind of world city over the last generation. And I think Terence's contribution to that is not insignificant. No. And it and it, it is probably the key one of the key things which is as a practice as an ethos we we're trying to continue to build and and uh, and uh, grow not least because as we're all aware the environmental sustainability side of life is now first and foremost and uh, taking that spirit of make do and mend as he always used to talk about inertly is the best starting point when we're trying to deal with these things and, and projects like the boundary. And you know, Terence didn't get directly involved in Centre Point, but he he was still around when we started that project. And I'd have many discussions with him, partly because he was very fascinated by it, because his first office in Neil's yard and uh, Neil Street um, watched the original structure go up. And he would say to me how exciting it was, because um, you know, it was that post-war uh, brave new world. It was Bauhaus in the flesh. You know, it was all of these things which he found terribly exciting. And he was very proud of the fact that we worked out a way of reinventing it and giving it an, a life for hopefully generations to come. And to act, but at the same time, to make it a better version of itself, to, yeah, make it work better than the way it dealt with the street and, and so forth. And actually it makes a much better residential building than it ever did as an office building. Mm. So he found that side of it really. Terence, if he had not been who he was, he 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 said to me that he, the one thing he would have liked to have been as an architect because he liked that idea of the possible. You know, it's always about the possible. The reality of, of course, as a practicing architect, you, you think you have that fun about the possible and you spend 90% of your time trying to get rid of all the, the obstacles which make it impossible. Um, and he had no pa no patience for that at all. You know, he, he couldn't. Leanne, do you have any questions for us? Yes, no. Well, um, I was going to remind people listening, if they've got any questions, please, we've only got a, uh, 10 minutes left. So now's the time to, to ask them. But Tim, just about that, the 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 his personality and his frustration, um, and we've talked about this a little bit in the sort of lead up to this talk. And 
I'm really fascinated now. I mean, and Roger and Stephen in the book, you know, you can really see the tension. You know, there's sort of love and hate for him. He's, you know, a very difficult man, but a genius. What, you know, we live in a different time now. You know, the, the way you run businesses, the way you interact with staff, the sort of difficult genius um, is, is seen differently. You know, can someone... You know, do you need someone's uh, someone like Terence to be able to bulldoze things through? And can those people exist now? I mean, is if there's a young up and coming Terence, can they can they operate male or female? Can they operate in today's uh, sort of culture? I, I think um, you know. I was uh, I left Terence in about 2013, so sort of eight years ago. So it's not that far away. And at that time, Terence was um, in his 80s. Um, and I think you would have been amazed if you'd been in our office then. It had, bearing in mind that my previous career was mostly in advertising, which thinks it's quite sort of on trend. There was a far higher percentage of women on the staff than any other business I've worked in. There was a far higher percentage of people from ethnic minorities than anywhere else I've worked. And I don't think that's because Terence wanted to be nice to everybody. I'd never noticed a huge tendency in that direction. Um, I think it was because he just wanted the best people and he didn't care where they came from. And actually, in terms of his own style, although you might have expected him to be quite bruising, actually, he was rather uh, old-fashionedly courteous with most of the people on the staff. The ones he was tough with are the people that were kind of near him in the power structure, if you like. He had no qualms about being beastly to me because he knew that I was a big boy and I'd stand up to him. But further down the ranks, he was actually rather gracious to people. And I think what enabled... He's got the reputation of being something that rather bulldozes his way through. But I think what achieved that wasn't him shouting at people. Um, he really didn't. I think it was just that his presence, he had an enormous, when he came into the room very slowly, uh, even when he was a young man, he always walked very slowly, he kind of had a kind of presence with it and his cigar in his hand and a rather stern look he had. Instantly, everybody was in awe of him. It was force of personality rather than bulldozing, which made things happen. It's a great gift. Mm. If you'd bottle it, you'd make a fortune. Yeah. I mean, um, we, we did have to rather... You, you, you had to choose your moment to when to push back and when not to. I, and to a certain extent, we're all victims of our own personality. So Terence kind of liked me because I was a scrapper and he thought I'd make things happen for him. Mm. Um, so he fake, forgave me if I pushed back equally tough back to him. And you know the fact that we ended up working with each other such a long, long time. He obviously thought there was some value in it but we did I did have to make sure that um he 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 adjusted for people less robust mm. you know he right. didn't it didn't he didn't do that naturally you know he thought that we should all be tough we he thought that you know and he came from that generation where it was quite macho mm. um but it was never, it, it was always a case of then me just talking to people afterwards and saying, look, this is what he's talking about. And they're all fine and they'll go back for more. Mm. Um, it was more of a language thing than an actual, you know, I, I never felt he was a, uh, a bully. Right, right. I, I thought, I, sorry, go on. No, no, no. I was, uh, I was just going to say, Peter Murray, uh, who is was my predecessor as chair of the London Society. He was just, uh, he's made a comment about meanness and generosity, and he said when he launched uh, Blueprint, Terence lent some money but suddenly asked for it back <laughs> um, at the worst possible time and sent. Uh, Gary, the accountant for from Anderson Young, to collect the check. Um, so it's a. It, complex man is i think the yeah, conclusion uh, a friend of his rang him up once uh, and said look there's something i'm struggling with i'd really can i buy you lunch and just pick your brain so somebody knew quite well it wasn't sort of like a, hiring a consultant it was one of his mates he said sure so they had a nice lunch and terence got back to the office 
before he'd even sat down at his desk, he said to his secretary, could you send whoever it was, um, an invoice for two hours of consultancy time at £500 oh an hour. Yeah, um, extraordinary, extraordinary. Most um, of us wouldn't have even imagined that, let alone actually done it. <laughs> no, I, well, motiv most of us wouldn't have been able to get away with it, I think, as well. Um, I, I think Roger's right. The, the thing about that is the shocking thing was about that is that he thought about it. Yes. Not that he yeah, did, yeah. It, was, it even crossed his mind to do it, which was, we all had experiences like that. But when I yeah. moved out, the man who grumbled endlessly about my bloody tea bags, which I discovered after I'd left, actually cost the same as the PG tips that we bought. <laughs> When I moved house, he sent me a bottle of Chateau Latour, which cost £500 as a housewarming present. So he's capable of being terribly stingy and amazingly generous, mm -hmm. all in the same breath. I'm, I'm going to, uh, we have a couple of questions that I just want to uh, get you to answer. And I think the two very interesting. One is, how did he become a uh, master planner of Butler's Wharf? Was it just because he owned it? And secondly, what about the failed projects um, or the, the buildings that never happened? I think that's very interesting. Well, the, the Butler's Wharf, he partnered with Fred Roche, who was, uh, Margaret Thatcher was busily closing down all the architects' departments, and Fred Roche uh, headed up the Milton Keynes Corporation architects' department, where they were basically building the new town. So Fred and uh, so at that point, Conrad and Partners was Conrad Roche, mm -hmm. and uh, so Fred was the master planner, mm -hmm. and Terence was. Uh, it 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 would it would not give Fred enough justice if you didn't if you didn't say he was also the visionary. But between them, they they came up with the, this um, way of regenerating in a way people weren't regenerating. Mm -hmm. Well, and the second question um, uh, failed uh, projects and also just another one and I've, we've got to squeeze these in we've got three uh, minutes and the current government's attitude to uh, cultural and sort of design industry but uh, failed projects uh, was there anything that didn't get built yeah I, I, I mean you can't produce as many as ideas as he did without some of them not getting airborne um, he Good example, Roger. Do you remember the um, uh, sorting office on New York? Mm, yes, yeah. Uh, he had an incredibly ambitious plan, which, if it had happened, would have been probably rather thrilling. And he couldn't get it funded, I think, essentially, not because it was a good idea or not, but because he was old. Mm -hmm. And I think he was about 78 when he started working on it. And I think people thought this could take five or six or seven years to get plans and built and so forth and Terence is the driving force do I want to invest my money in somebody who statistically is quite likely to be dead before the project's launched so that was a sadness but you have to say on the whole his success rate in making things happen was extraordinary he built 30 years and a hotel in London uh, th sorry 30 restaurants and a hotel in nine years um and a, a, a sort of fitting fitting question to end on you you said at the beginning tim about being a tory um how did he feel about the current current government's oh he he, attitude? Um, he he would have hated the current government attitude he would it's, it would have stood for everything uh he hated um he was he wasn't nationalistic at all he was very uh uh, cosmopolitan he believed in being a European he he was a great fan of Gordon Brown he started off being a great fan of Tony Blair until Tony Blair went to war so mm -hmm. very anti -war. so a bit like Richard Rogers uh, despite the fact he had a reputation of being connected with luxury mm -hmm. he his heart as was a socialist yeah I think you know Terence has a reputation of being uh, quite ruthless and in many ways quite self-serving and that's not entirely unkind, but actually underneath that, he was in many ways a kind of very moral person. He was very difficult to deal with, but he was never devious. Mm. Yeah, he might stab you, but you could be confident it would be in the chest, not the back. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, that's our hour uh, is up. Um, it's been a fascinating conversation. I'm sorry Stephen couldn't make it, and I really hope he is... Uh, uh, he's well, but you've done uh, a brilliant job in um, bringing 
you know, bringing, uh, I was about to say him to life, which is probably not the right thing to say, but um, making it a fabulous conversation. And thank you to our audience for staying on and um, uh, good night and have a good evening and we'll see you at the next event. Thank you.